From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Your number's ringing now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, swell. Aimwell Agency. Aimwell Detectives? Yes. Who are you calling, please? Want to talk to Mr. Aimwell. My name's Johnny Dollar. This is Aimwell. I understand your agency's been looking for the Perling girl for about a year now. Oh, you do, huh? And who told you that? Mrs. Perling. I never heard of you, or her, or a girl. So long. <laughs> this is the operator. Were you cut off, Mr. Dollar? I'll call them back. Never mind. Call me a cab, honey. I'll talk to them in person. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. <laughs> Item 7, $3, cab fare, my hotel to the office of the Aimwell Agency. A red-headed girl at the switchboard looked me over like I was a car she didn't want to buy. I told her my name and that I wanted to see Niles Aimwell. She told me to sit down and wait. Three minutes later, she waved me down a long, carpeted corridor. I followed directions. A typewriter clacked somewhere. Men in those suits with the little shoulders and hem-stitching for lapels moved in and out of offices. It looked more like an advertising office than a detective agency. Finally, I opened a door and stepped into a small room that was decorated in gray. Gray walls, gray carpeting, gray draperies. A desk, a brass lamp, a filing cabinet, and a man were there. He didn't get up when I walked in, but slouched back in his chair and let his bald head rest against the wall. You're kind of determined, aren't you? I suppose so. You're Aimwell? Mm-hmm. On the phone, I told you I didn't know what you were talking about. Now I'll tell you again. Don't slam the door when you go out. What are you paying rent here? <laughs> if I've got it figured right, you wish you weren't paying it. But then a place like this draws a snappier crowd of clients, so uh, what you've got in the end is more clients and more rent, no more money for yourself. Now that you've said all that, will you get out of here? I know one of those snappy clients happens to be the Perlings. I know you've been trying to find their daughter. This is my ID. This is my license, bond, letter of authority from Eastern Liability. Now, two days ago, the papers carried a story that David Perling was killed in a boating accident in Key West. That was a lot of baloney. It was retracted. I know that, but I talked to a reporter down in Key West who told me Perling paid to have that story about himself printed. My client had an idea Perling might have done it to set up the stock market for a killing. Mrs. Perling told me he did it in the hope his missing daughter would see the story in the papers and contact home. Now, what have you got to say? Here's your stuff. One other thing. Perling the kind of man who'd pull a trick like that? Ask him. You got a way about you I don't like. Well, that's too bad. But in between the time I called and the time I got here, you had time to call the Perlings on the phone and ask about me. They said it was all right to tell me what I wanted to know. If there was a daughter, if you'd been hired to look for her, if you don't tell me, you might jeopardize the part of the rent the Perlings pay for you. Now, look, darling. I've got something else you aren't going to like. I might just want to see your operative's report on the case. I might have the idea that if you've been looking for her this long, you might just be dragging it out a little bit. You know, the rent money, it's due every month. Get Mr. or Mrs. Perling on the phone right away. I hope they tell me to throw you out on your ear. <laughs> well, while we're waiting, let's get back to the questions. Where have you looked? What have you done? We pulled a case 11 months ago, almost to the day. The girl's 5'5", five, five, 114 pounds, no visible scars, no glasses. Black hair, brown eyes. She's 24, will be 25 next month. We thought we had her located in Muncie, Toledo, Detroit, Fort Worth, and Pueblo. We think she's traveling alone. We think she's a little girl who was fed up to here with Mama and Daddy and just struck out for herself. But you haven't found her. Five men have been looking on eight-hour shifts, seven days a week for 11 months to the day. Five men, 11 months, seven days a week, and I'm one of the five. My feet hurt, my head aches most of the time. My wife's thinking about divorcing me. And then you walk in here and plant yourself in my office. You're suggesting maybe I can go out and find her just like that. 
Well, I can't. Nobody can. So I want you to know I kind of resent that remark about how I'm laying down on the job. And if you don't take it back, I'll have to cave in the side of the wall with you. What do you got to say, Dalton? <laughs> I take it back, Mr. Ringwell. Sit down and have yourself a smoke. Hello? Well, hello, Mrs. Perling. Mr. Dollar's in my office now. Yes, yes, I'll cooperate with him. Yes, Mrs. Perling, I understand. He explained it all to me. Yes, ma'am. <sighs> the whole file, everything. How would you like somebody to bring up a bottle of cold beer? Oh, I'd like that fine, Mr. Amwell. Niles Amwell, in between complaining about the abundance of bad private operatives in the detective business, showed me how good he was. The Jeannie Perling file was a comprehensive day-to-day -day report on the investigation. His discouragement in the case was understandable. The only thing that meant something was the picture of Jeannie Perling. Coal black hair over a fresh white skinned face. Dark eyes, a nice smile. Somehow, not my idea of the daughter that would belong to David Perling. Too old, too young, or too something. I couldn't put my finger on it. If I had been able to, I could have ended this expense account right here. As it was, I spent $100,000. Somebody else's money, sure. But I spent it just the same. Well, Mr. Dollar, I'm certainly surprised at this development. You say Perling's daughter is missing? That's right, Mr. Scottman. And I'm convinced that the detective agency he's had looking for her have been doing just that. Eh, well, then, I'm relieved to know you got to the bottom of this matter. I'm sorry, of course, for Mr. and Mrs. Perling. But, as I say, relieved that there, there was no attempt at financial manipulation. I think then I can call you off the case. There is no case now. Nope. Guess not. And that's the way it stood at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I told Mr. Scottman I'd send him a bill. We shook hands and he wandered off to see if he could get a night flight back to Hartford. I went up to my room to pack and was folding a shirt all wrong when it struck me that I suddenly didn't believe anything or anybody. The idea that there was money in it somewhere still kept coming back to me. I couldn't shake it. I finished packing and left my bags at the desk. I wandered out and found a bar and sat down to think. After a couple of hours, nothing much occurred to me. But I did something anyhow. Oh, hello, Dollar. Hi. My uh, plane doesn't leave till 11 o'clock. I haven't had dinner yet. I, hope oh, I didn't come about dinner, Mr. Scudman. Well, what is it? Well, how does this case strike you? Eh? A phony death report, a missing girl, a stock market manipulation that didn't come off. How does it strike you? Well, very neat, if that's a phrase I can use, Mr. Dollar. We had a question with serious implications to it. We have an answer now. That's what we wanted. But it's too neat. I'm not sure I know quite what you mean. Look, you first called me in because it was halfway in your mind that Perling's alleged death was for the purpose of making money on the market. Now, why did you think that? It was a possibility. But what else? What about Perling? What do you mean? Do you know him? Ever met him? Do you think he was capable of a thing like that? Not now. No. I have proof from you that that wasn't his reason at all. But you thought so before you had that proof. You suspected it. I suppose I did, yes. Well, I didn't know him from a load of coal, but I always figured there's money in it somewhere. And I've met David Perling. He doesn't seem like the kind of man who'd worry about a grown daughter who didn't like him and ran away. Just, just didn't seem that way. Oh, here now. A detective agency working on the case, a story in the paper. But no police, Mr. Scottman. No bulletins. No 100% effort to find her. Why? I suppose you have a good point. I'm sure I have a good point, Mr. Scottman. Money's always a good point. But what money, how, why, I don't know. I can't answer those questions. I wish I could. If I could, I'd know that a man like Dave Perling was lying through his teeth if he told me he wanted his daughter back safe at home. I'd know why he was lying. I know I'm just talking and getting nowhere right now, but... Well, I thought, I thought I'd better tell you what was on my mind. Yes, well, you've certainly done that. Now what? That's up to you. Oh. Well, if you feel so strongly about this, I think then you should continue. I thought it was ended, but in view of the circumstances, continue. By all means, continue. Well, Dollar, 
Well, you're working late. Yeah, I'd rather stay here than go home sometimes. Most of the time. Hey, well, we might be seeing quite a bit of each other. How did you know? Hmm? Perling told me to contact you. You're pretty cute, Dollar. Tell me why. You hardly ever run across a picture of a girl you'd like to look at as much as this Perling dame. Oh, I might have. You know, you kid me most of the time, and I'm an old slob who stands around with hardly any fast answers. But you aren't kidding me this time, Pally. You show it all over. If I walked in a place and I seen a girl as nice looking as this, and I had any business with her, I'd be the luckiest guy in the world. You know, there are women, and there are women. But if that picture means anything, boy, she's a woman. And you want to meet her, right? Sure I want to meet her, but you're getting romantic. And if I saw, but didn't have any business with her, just saw, I'd go take a walk around the block before I talked to anybody. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I don't blame you. You're a very lucky fella. You're going to see her. That's why Perling asked me to contact you. Huh? Here. Came in about an hour ago. One of our men located her. Where? She's in New Orleans. He handed me the wire and I read it over. Then I looked at him, he looked at me. I didn't ask any questions, he didn't say a word. It was a wonderful make-believe world, but it really didn't exist. Too neat and too tidy. And we all know the world's full of bumps. Ever hear of Mount Everest? Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, once you get in on a joke, you do what they tell you. You go along with a gag. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking.